welcome back one and all for a very special Naval History edition of the Proceedings Podcast. Brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield. This is a very special get together for Naval History Magazine to discuss the matters of the history of our Navy that we always discuss because today that history is the history of our own organization, the U.S. Naval Institute. It was 150 years ago this October that this venerable organization was created here on the grounds of the U.S. Naval Academy by 15 officers who were concerned about the direction the Navy was taking after the Civil War. It had stagnated, it had dead end. The other navies of the world were advancing apace in all the technological advancements in ship design that we had pioneered ourselves during that Civil War. From that humble beginning began an organization that has influenced positively the debate about the course of the U.S. fleet and the direction it should take, the pros and cons, the problems, the room for improvement, and all the leading lights of the Navy in that century and a half have contributed to the open forum that is the U.S. Naval Institute. So we're proud to present in the current September-October edition of Naval History Magazine an article that looks at those 15 founders of the U.S. Naval Institute. And joining us here today to discuss them is my esteemed colleague and friend, Lieutenant Commander Thomas Cutler, U.S. Navy retired. Hello, Tom. Hey, how are we doing? We're doing okay. Tom has an article in the current issue called 15 Founders, which is just that. We always hear about the main founder, and we'll talk about him momentarily, John L. Worden, hero of the Monitor, later the uh, principal founding light of the Institute. But he was one of 15. And in this article, Tom gives them all their requisite due. And it's a very interesting thing. Even if you know a bit about the history of the oranges and so the Institute, you'll find more to uh, devour here than you probably knew before. I know we certainly did. So Tom, uh, welcome aboard. And why don't we start by talking about John L. Worden and take it from there. Why don't you just talk about how this all came about? Um, well, the way it came about is, as you already alluded to, is the fact that there were uh, a bunch of uh, disgruntled Naval officers at the Naval Academy. They were unhappy with the way the Navy had uh, and be, what, what the Navy had become since the Civil War. Um, tremendous downgrading of, of capabilities in so many ways. And as you pointed out, uh, the rest of the world was moving ahead with things like uh, steam power and armor and rifled guns and that sort of stuff. All this technology was coming forward. And yet our Navy was, was uh, largely ignoring it or very little progress in those areas. Navy was down to 52 ships, and, and those ships were generally considered more suitable to the 1840s than to, uh, to the, the 1870s that they were now, now in. <clears throat> so as it turned out, we're never quite sure exactly who had the, the idea. Some give, give credit to Commodore Parker, some to uh, Lieutenant Belknap and so forth. But somebody came up with the idea, let's get together and talk about this. And interestingly, Admiral Warden, who was the superintendent at the Naval Academy, um, said uh, he, he agreed to this and, and joined the meeting. And in fact, uh, was, was a, a key, key member of it. So they got together um, and started talking about what to do about the Navy. What can we, how can we change things and so forth. And somewhere along the line, they decided to uh, continue this discussion and formed what became uh, the, the Naval Institute. Again, not clear how much of the, this was preconceived and how much emerged at the meeting itself, but that is, in fact, the way it went. They, they had this rather important meeting and, and kicked things off. Uh, Admiral Warden, <clears throat> besides be, by that time being the superintendent of Naval Academy, this he was re very well known. It was an American hero of, uh, of great rapport. Uh, he had been the commander of the USS Monitor during the, the famous battle of the the Monitor and the uh, Virginia. Uh, I, I would point out it's the Virginia, not the Merrimack, as so many people they want to call it the Monitor and the Merrimack, but it's the Monitor and the Virginia because she'd been captured by the, the Confederate Navy. So he was the commanding officer, and his executive officer, Samuel Dana Green, uh, turned out to be at the Naval Academy at the same time and was part of this original 15. So that's, that's one of those ironies or 
coincidences, whatever you want to call it, in history, where these two men served together in combat uh, in one of the great battles of American naval history, and then turned around and, and, and met up again at the Naval Academy and helped found the, the U.S. Naval Institute. So that's quite a resume, if you think about it, just in those, those, those terms alone. Real quickly, a um, um, little bit of trivia here. Everybody knows that knows this story that um, the Institute was founded here at the Academy and we've been here ever since. Uh, we're kind of a sort of unique entity in that regard. But let's talk about where that first meeting took place, that legendary first gathering of the Institute. Well, yeah, I was in a, uh, one of the academic buildings uh, here on, on the grounds. They uh, gathered there and they met there for quite some time. Um, over the years, the Institute moved to a lot of different places. And in fact, a little known fact is that it wound up in uh, Mahan Hall, which is one of the uh, rather uh, one of the landmarks here at the Naval, Naval Academy. Beautiful and building. A beautiful building. And, and up and Mahan has a, a rather uh, striking tower that goes up. And that's where the offices of the Naval Institute were. And what's interesting about that is that if you go up there today, and it's not easy, it's kind of blocked off and so forth, but you go up into those spaces, those offices are still there, and there are some beautiful wood carvings up in the corners of the, of the offices, with, you know, the federal eagles with their wings spread, and that's sort of the typical of the, of the mm -hmm. times. And in the center of the shield of, the, of the, uh, these, these uh, eagle uh, pieces, it, are the letters NI for Naval Institute. And actually, when we came over here to, uh, to our current headquarters at Beach Hall, um, I tried to get permission to remove one of those and bring them over and put it on display here. But they said it was a National Historic Landmark and couldn't be messed with or whatever. So now they're still up in that tower. Nobody ever sees them, but that's that's the way it works. Well, we should get up there and photograph them, if nothing else. I, I very much want to see that now myself. Can yeah. you imagine how hot it was up there in the late 1800s? Yeah. Well, they eventually, they eventually uh, <clears throat> moved out for a couple of reasons. They, <clears throat> one of them was the fact that the staff had become, uh, some of the staff had become elderly and rather corpulent, and, and there's no elevator in that tower. You have to climb those stairs and so forth. So they, they found other headquarters, and, and we moved a couple of times through the years, but uh, we were in Preble Hall for, for a good while, which we helped to build, and, and now we're over at Beach Hall uh, in our, our really nice headquarters. And, well, let's get back to those original founders and then we'll follow the history of the Institute through because I was about to go off on an epic digression there talking about Preble <laughs> Hall. Yeah, that a little bit later. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, John L. Worden is, is um, remembered as sort of the forefront guy in our founding. Uh, he was our first uh, president, et cetera. And he was the um, soup here at the time and all that. But there were others uh, that were instrumental in getting this thing off the ground. Let's give some of them their due as well. Um, you mentioned... Um, Samuel Dana Green, who also had been his XO on the monitor, uh, he's, he's a key player early on too, isn't he? Yes, he was at that first meeting, continued for some time. And in fact, he's one of the, about, of those original 15 founders, uh, been able to trace that five of them uh, later published, uh, were published very soon. And he was one of them. Um, <clears throat> there were some, uh, some of the others also published. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, at any rate, we have uh, uh, one of the key founders uh, besides Green was uh, Commodore Foxhole Parker, and uh, he's a very interesting character in, in, in many ways. One of them was the fact that his uh, brother, Harwar Parker, I think that's how you say the name, H-A-R-W-A-R, Harwar Parker, uh, went south in the Civil War, whereas uh, Foxhole stayed, stayed north, became loyal to the Union. Uh, his brother actually headed the Confederate States Naval Academy. So that was kind of an interesting side there too. But Foxhall Parker also came back later to become a superintendent of the Naval Academy, as did uh, four others, uh, four total. Uh, there were four superintendents, including Warden, and uh, as I said, several others, and Foxhall Parker was one of those. Um, <clears throat> He also wrote, wrote rather prolifically, did some things on fleet tactics, on naval howitzers afloat, uh, fleets of the world, and, and a number of other things. He wrote not just magazine articles, but, but books as well. 
So he was a, uh, a rather well-known writer in his own day. Yeah, Foxhall Parker is one of my favorite ones. Um, he, he had some key parts in the Civil War. And if you want to look at the idea, the often almost cliched um, statement about the Civil War, that it was brother against brother, that was literally true in the case of many, many families. And the Parkers are a good example of that. Um, a lot of the uh, officers here, when the war broke out, had divided loyalties. Some, of course, went south. Um, some stayed loyal. But that's a story for another day because that's an amazing story. So they started this thing up. Um, and then what would soon follow is the proceedings of their meetings would be gathered together and published for uh, uh, more to reach a larger audience and uh, stimulate further discussion. Um, that happens very early on in our history, too, as well, doesn't it? Yeah, it's true. And, and in fact, um, you know, we call it proceedings and one would think it, it almost be like a log book of what they talked about. And in some ways that was true. But but they also one of the things that they did at these meetings early on, they decided to discuss specific topics, historical topics, current techno, te technological uh, subjects and that sort of thing. And those became articles that appeared in that in those proceedings and then ultimately led to the the uh, creation of the magazine um, and we've been doing it ever since and since 1874 really there have been magazine articles uh, from proceedings and uh, and then of course the spin-off to Naval History magazine which we were all familiar with today but that that came along much longer much later um, some of these guys were uh, among them there were nine nine of them went on to be admirals and that's a pretty good track record when you think nine out of 15 became admirals um pretty impressive warden of course being one of them and we already mentioned uh um Foxel parker and then there are also uh, a number of others um but some of these guys one might say this was the high point the high watermark of their careers as far as founding the naval institute because I was, all the research i was not able to find much about some of the others um charles belknap we know about because he actually convened the meeting put the word out for it and he actually wrote but beyond that we know very little about him uh lieutenant commander j.e craig uh, i could find out so little on him and then uh two gentlemen were one was a pay inspector james murray and a medical director philip lonsdale they were participants obviously founders and uh, had that credential <clears throat> but could not find much uh, much of anything beyond that um, others though uh, distinguished themselves in combat both in the uh, civil war before the founding of the institute and then many of them participated in the spanish-american war um, so they were they were around for uh, for that in various ways several of them commanded served in and commanded the asiatic fleet which was of course the we go in the Far East back in the those days of the Navy before we got to um, our current setup and so forth. The, yeah, um, good. you know, we came along at just the right time, it's sort of an existential point in the Navy's um, existence. And what will follow and the debates that are um, being stirred and stimulated by the uh, meetings of the Institute and the proceedings of them that are getting out there. Uh, and it's it's fun if you look back um, at the early like uh, sort of logs of minutes of the meetings, uh, the institute in its earliest days, and you look uh, the 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 attendees would sign their signature at the bottom of it, and you'll see names in there like Theodore Roosevelt, Alfred yeah. Thayer Mahan. Uh, this was attracting uh, leading thinkers in this debate, and this is the very period that leads to the rise of the New Steel Navy, and. Um, that's essentially the prototypical uh, prototype of the Navy that will emerge as the uh, dominant force on sea in the following century. So this, this is kind of a pivotal moment that uh, we came into being. And we're part of the, those all important debates that led to that um, rebirth, if you will, in a more modernized sense of the Navy. Yeah, that's right. And of course, in the same period, the Naval War College came along um, after, after we did, and several of the founders at the, uh, at the Naval Institute participated in the early days of the Naval War College, 
Uh, one of them, Pernell Harrington, is the lieutenant commander at the time of the founding. Actually, three of them were all lieutenant commanders, Pernell uh, Harrington, Casper Goodrich, and Charles Jackson Train were all lieutenant commanders. But <clears throat> they went from there to the Naval War College. Um, uh, Casper, uh, and they were there at the same time as Maham in the early days, Casper Goodrich became the third president of the, of the uh, uh, Naval War College, and he also participated in the Spanish-American War. So <clears throat> there is kind of a link between, you know, sometimes you think about the Naval Institute, the Naval Academy, and the Naval War College as all these kind of those academic, semi-academic tr uh, triad, and, and there's a lot of links, cross links between the three, I think, as you can see from the way this developed. Right. Well, it was the zeitgeist, wasn't it? I mean, yeah. it was either um, march or die, so to speak, for the Navy at that point. They either yeah. had to get on board and uh, enter the uh, late 19th century uh, modernism, or yeah. they could just flounder into the past and be like a, a rotting coastal fleet at, at best. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to think of as being at that point um, as a country that we let the Navy get that way, but really hasn't that always been the, the fight it's had to do, justify its existence? Um, yeah, it's... And it's yeah. Hang on, he got disconnected. Um, we can just cut this out. Can you cut it where my question ended? Yeah, I think so. Okay, let us get him. Let us get him. Hang on, let me see. Let me go check on him because I don't know that he's aware that he's not connected. Yeah, he might yeah, still. He might still yeah. <laughs> Hang on. Oh, it's 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 all right. So, Tom. Hey, I'm back. Yeah, um, where that last question ended, he's going to be able to cut it right there. So just start with that answer fresh. We should have a good one. What was the question? I forget. Whoops, hang on. Damn. I was hoping you remember. Um, <laughs> hold on. I'll think of it. 
It was kind of a broad question, which is why I'm having trouble remembering exactly what it was. Yeah. I was trying to give you plenty of stuff to just like riff on. It was something about, um, Heather, are you there? Where does she get back? We'll find I'm out. I'm here. What was the, what was what, the, how did my question like, end? end? Mm. Is it hard Is to it go hard back? To go back? I'd have to end the recording and. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Damn it! What did I say? Well, maybe okay. Do a, different, do a different one. We'll just edit that one out or something. I don't know. Yeah, I was talking about sort of the crisis in the Navy at that point and how it was either yes, it was either for, go forward or perish, and uh, how we were part of that kind of mix and helping the rise of the navalists, the rise of the new steel Navy. Um, so maybe just talk about the crisis that the Navy was in, how serious it was and how this is what, you know, this was a key time period to be having these discussions. Something like that. Does that right. Give you enough to work right. on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me think of a better way to put it. That's, that's right. Okay. Um, uh, Eric, why don't you just rephrase the question the way you just did, and then we'll, we'll just jump in. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Let me go back to where I was. Um, all right. Let's try this. Go ahead and roll it. Hopefully it'll work. Yes, this really was an like, existential moment in the Navy's history. Um, it came along. Um, it was either march or die. Uh, coin a phrase from the French Foreign Legion, uh, either had to um, adapt and advance into the uh, new emerging era of naval ships and uh, fighting at sea, or be reduced to a crumbling, rotting fleet worthy of coastal patrol, maybe at the most. And it's shocking to think, Eric, we as a nation, we ever allowed it to get to this point. But then if you think about it, there have been so many times along the way in the chapters of the saga of the Navy where it has had to do just that, justify its existence to a peacetime population, explain how you can't just wait till there's a war and suddenly snap your fingers and you have a fleet. You have to always be ready. We've always had to repeatedly kind of lobby to make that lesson clear. And um, it was certainly true at this time. So our arrival makes sense that it would happen at this time. There's plenty of officers, professional men of the Navy that are worried about this. And this gave them, gave them a chance to have a, a platform, a soapbox to discuss it. Uh, so important, if you think about it. We couldn't have appeared at a more necessary time. Well, yeah, you make a good point, Eric, um, a, a really crucial point. And this was, a, this was a pivotal point in history because the Navy had come out of the Civil War successfully, you know, uh, w winning that war, but at the same time, um, going into this, this period of the doldrums, if you want a uh, good analogy, I think. And then it's also on the cusp, if you think about it, this is 1873, and within uh, a couple of decades here, the Navy starts to emerge as a world power. And the Spanish-American War is kind of that turning point and so forth. But I think more important than that even is the fact that that the Navy has always suffered from this problem of the, the people do not understand the importance of the Navy. They understand it when there's a war on. It's very obvious. They, the Navy goes out and sinks ships and does all these great things. But when you look at it, you know, World War II, we, we actually... Uh, for all the great glory that and well-deserved glory of the Navy in World War II, it was fighting that war because it had failed earlier to deter the enemy. We had let ourselves slip into such a period of, of uh, decay, if you will, that the Japanese and the Germans felt like they, they felt it was a good opportunity to, to confront our Navy and so forth. And that's how we wound up in, in that war. And this is the same kind of thing that goes on periodically is because people just do not understand the importance of the Navy. The fact that keeping the sea lanes open um, is, is what it's all about. And go, go to Walmart and look at all those full shelves of, of goods there. They don't get there because magically the sea lanes are the, the way that things get there and they have to uh, keep, keep the sea lanes open. And that's the purpose of the Navy. Um, and that's why the, 
the Naval, founding of the Naval Institute is so very important. Uh, it's true that not every American citizen or not even very many American citizens, when you think of the percentages, read proceedings. But proceedings is that forum that allows people to talk about the problems and how to solve them and come up with all these uh, solutions. And has done this for ever since 18, uh, 1870s. We've been doing this and providing this, this forum. We, we always talk about the forum. And what happens from that is that the forum then affects Navy leadership, but it also, some of these things bleed off into uh, other media and people do find out about important subjects and so forth. It uh, doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, it's profound. And I think that this is the thing that we, we got to keep in mind that we're not just a, you know, a publisher of magazines for entertainment. It's a much, much more important mission. And these 15 men, whether they, they realize it at the time or not, were doing a tremendous service to the Navy by having this this almost mutinous meeting uh, to discuss the problems of the Navy and, and try to solve them. Indeed. And it's always fascinating to look through the, um, the vaults, if you will, of the proceedings of the U.S. Naval Institute. And every um, august name in modern American naval history appears in there as a byline at some point, it seems like. Some quite prolifically and quite often. Some when they're younger and they haven't become um, household names yet. Others after their um, time in battle um, explaining or maybe even justifying their actions um, in battle. So you've got people like uh, Nimitz as a young man writing for the magazine influentially. And that's just one name out of my hat. But um, where you have after World War II, publishing battle narratives from that war, like it, almost in virtual real time. Um, you know, it, it could be like a, a sea fight from 1943 as a proceedings article by 1944. And that's such valuable stuff, it's such a, um, a treasure trove of the history of the Navy. But at the time it's happening, it's them discussing the current events of the Navy. And mm -hmm. um, I think those 15 founders were dealing with the crisis of their own time in the fleet. But what they set up, what they established is something that is a perfect working model for this kind of thing at any point in the Navy's history. If they'd started it after the War of 1812, when the fleet, again, was like, well, there's a lot of, uh, we had a great, uh, some great ship on ship wins there, but now we're expanding westward. We need a fleet for um, the fleets being allowed to sort of maybe founder if they don't adapt steam. There's always been a place for a Naval Institute. It could have even started sooner at an earlier time of crisis and helped then. But thank goodness it started when it did, because the larger naval battles that the world has ever seen, the na larger naval conflicts the world has ever seen will happen in the century that follows. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to imagine how the United States could have weathered the storms of the 20th century without a powerful fleet. Um, and that all started in the end of the 19th century. And I feel like the Institute was a big part of that. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, you know, you mentioned several times uh, the word history. And I think another thing that is important about the Naval Institute um, is the fact that while you're right, a lot of this stuff was contemporary writing, it becomes history in, you know, later on. And uh, my good friend, uh, uh, Craig Simons, who's a well-known author, uh, 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 great, wonderful author, and published some of the best literature there is, the best history there is. Uh, he told me one day that he was going through one of his books, and it suddenly struck him that so much of what he was using for research to try to figure out, you know, to write this this history that he was writing, were Naval Institute Press books and Naval uh, history magazine and proceedings. All of these things contributed to a, a tremendous degree to his research. And uh, he, he gives us credit that I think is, is well deserved uh, in that regard. Uh, you know, going back to the founders, um, one thing I think we should point out, you know, we talk about the Naval Institute, and it is in fact naval in the sense that 
it's not just the Navy, it's the Marine Corps, and, and of course the Coast Guard plays in that as well. And one of the one of the uh, founding uh, members, uh, one of the founders was in fact a Marine captain, a guy by the name of McLean Tilton. And I think uh, uh, we, we had no Coast Guard representative at the time, but we did have the Marine, a, a Marine representation. He was the head of the Marine Guard at the Naval Academy at the time and joined this group. And uh, he went on, he had served uh, during the Civil War, he'd served in the West uh, Gulf Blockading Squadron. And he also commanded, I think, the Marine Barracks in Washington at some point later on. So uh, that's, that's another founder who contributed there. The rest of them were all were all Navy as opposed to uh, uh, Navy, Naval. So. Uh, but I just want to make sure we, we get credit where credit is due there. Because, yeah. you know, if you look at proceedings over the years and, and Naval history for that matter, uh, Marines are there uh, contributing a tremendous amount. Um, you know, Marines have a wonderful reputation as, as combat uh, uh, combatants, but they also are really good at, at uh, uh, the other other side of the intellectual side of things they, they pay a great deal of attention to their own history and to, and and using that kind of, of vehicle so so that they also deserve credit in that, that regard i think yeah i think they're strong enough because they're always striving to improve to improve on their uh, capabilities their efficiency and um that's the larger purpose i think of the very existence of the institute is what can uh any branch of the fleet do to improve and get better and um, uh, refine this. And um, that the the great history of uh, the Pacific War is the Navy and the Corps um, learning from the mistakes as they happen in the real time of war, the biggest war anybody had ever been in at sea. And the the, the turnaround time, the learning curve is so quick um, in, in the face of that and the exigencies of war that it's one of the most impressive things about the Pacific War to me is how um, those that were fighting it were able to learn from their mistakes quickly and improve them in time to like achieve victory within a matter of a few years. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it's great that there's a Marine right there at the outset um, in the mix at the Institute, and they've been a part of it for sure ever since. So. Well, um, yeah. go ahead, Tom. You're about to say something. Uh, one thing is also interesting is that. <clears throat> 60 years after that founding there were two uh two two men were still alive and they uh, brownson and harrington were still around and in fact made some contributions uh wrote some short uh, pieces for proceedings to commemorate the 60th anniversary and you think about it, that's that's a lot of longevity but that's also interesting because the naval institute has long had a loyal following, if you were. People become members and they stay members. And, and we've, we've had this policy of after 50 years, they, they become life members. Um, and we have many, many life members have had and, and continue to have many life members. So that's that says something about the importance. Uh, anything that has that kind of longevity, I think, uh, also indicates that it's doing something well and, and worthwhile. Mm hmm. And in addition to the proceedings, of course, very early on, we started our book publishing initiative, and that has been a major force for the um, improvement uh, and elucidation of the fleet and those who are interested in these matters ever since as well. Uh, maybe we can uh, just throw in a little um, plug for that while we're at it. Yeah, well, that's, that's an important thing. Of course, uh, one of the earliest things we did, uh, one of the most important things we did was create the Blue Jackets Manual, and that has been... Uh, published by the Naval Institute and given to every sailor uh, at boot camp, uh, even to this day. So that book is, has got some real longevity, but it, it started in 1902 and has continued to today. Um, but the the, uh, the book publishing arm has been of, of, uh, of great great importance to, uh, as I said before, you know, Craig Simons re uh, referring to b books as well as magazines and that sort of thing. So yeah, I think the, the press uh, is one of the offshoots of that thing, uh, that, that original founding, if you will, that uh, is also carried on. And of course, we've done other things. Other things have sprung out of that. We have an oral history program that's very uh, important. Uh, 
plays a tr tremendous role in, in keeping the historical record and getting it in, in a different form that I think is really useful, particularly for historical researchers and, and that, that sort of thing. Um, and, and today we have this marvelous conference center that's <laughs> just incredible, that's this breaking uh, new ground uh, in things that we do. We hold a lot of seminars and, and things that, that also contribute to, uh, to the forum, the, 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 this important forum that we are always talking about. Yeah, I would agree with you on that. But before we go down that road, um, before we leave the books um, aspect of it, yeah, think about the um, unquantifiable level of influence that is. Every recruit that walks in Great Lakes gets that Blue Jackets manual and has since forever. It's essentially the scout handbook for the Navy, and that's the Institute's baby. They've always done it. And a shout out to my guest here. Uh, Tom here has written uh, the – um, the recent editions of it for some time. So, um, Heather, we okay? Yeah, you froze up there for a minute. But. Yeah, you briefly froze, but I think we're back. Do I need to redo that or can you work around it? The last thing I got was that you said Tom had uh, written the Blue Jackets manual and then it kind of cut off there. So we can't bring up something as big as the Blue Jackets manual without giving a plug to, of kudos to Tom here, who has uh, been its author for a number of years now. And I like to say that if uh, you ever meet Joe or Jane Citizen and there's nothing about the Navy, or anything about it at all, um, you should hand them a Blue Jackets manual, and that should be their 101. So proud to know you, Tom, just for that alone, in addition to all the rest of it. Well, you just you brought up uh, our amazing facility here now, uh, Jackson Taylor Conference Center, but uh, and it's you know we're in Beach Hall, and we've been here since 1999, I believe. Yes, um, but before that, uh, we were in uh, Preble Hall. You mentioned. Uh, there at the heart of the uh, of the academy campus, um, and that was built in the 30s. And we had something that we were instrumental in the building of that as well, right? And we were there for a long time until the 1990s, right? Yeah, it's true. The uh, uh, at some point, the, uh, the Naval Academy and the Naval Athletic Association got together and raised money to build Preble Hall, which then became the museum at the Naval Academy. And part of that uh, uh, that package was that we would occupy the uh, upper floors. They'd have the museum on the ground floor, and then our office would be in the upper floors. And we were there for many years. Um, it eventually got to be rather crowded. Oh, uh, but by the way, that we we did another uh, campaign and raised more money. This time, without the Naval Academy Athletic Association, and put an addition on to Preble Hall. So if you go and look at it, you can see that. There's a dividing line there in the color of the bricks and so forth, but there's an added part. But we stayed there for quite a while um, in those upper offices, and eventually we were operating in the in the attic there. With we had cubicles in the attic, and things were getting pretty crowded. And the Naval Academy wanted decided they wanted those that office space, so we struck a deal. We moved over into the uh, the old Naval Hospital that's over on across the creek, and we. That's where we are now. We created Beach Hall out of one wing of, of that hospital, and uh, so that, and then just recently added the conference center. Uh, going back to um, the, the books and the authors, is a, one of the things we've also had is loyal. Or I don't know if the word loyal is right, but we've had uh, continuous authorship from some people. Some people have contributed over many years. Uh, one of the most everybody knows Admiral Jim Stavridis has been contributing at every every level of his, uh, from a midshipman all the way to, to full admiral. He's written books and articles for the Institute. But there have been others in history, too. There was one, a guy named Holloway Frost, who was in his own right a combat veteran and so forth. And he wrote a book on ship handling. He wrote the history of the Battle of Jutland uh, and contributed many articles over the years. So many that when, when Frost finally um, passed away, there was actually an obituary that said 
that said the the Naval Institute has been defrosted and uh, kind of a strange place for humor but at the same time it, it, it tells of the fact that frost had been around so long and been such an interval part and there have been others over the years and we could you know spend a lot of time on that we don't want to uh, do too much of that but but I think it's very important to understand that that there's that uh, that loyalty factor if you will mm -hmm. so all the things that the Naval, Naval Institute has become were there encoded in it in its very origins it seems like if you think about it Proceedings Magazine, the Naval Institute Press, a, a forum for discussing these issues, i.e., in this case now, conferences and events and things like that. It was all there uh, in the DNA of this organization from the very get-go. And I'm not sure that 15 founders realized it would last this long. If they had thought to the, ahead to the year 2023, it would have sounded like something out of Jules Verne to them to even think about that date, 2023. It's hard for them to be imagine they were picturing they would still be around then. The institute would still be around then, but it has, and uh, it continues to grow strong. And you made an important point earlier, Tom. I think about how it's important for the citizenry to understand there's a, a, a crucial value to a fleet far beyond the war fighting that is what people think of when they think of a navy, a fighting navy. It's keeping those sea lanes open, and the world's economy is so intricately intertwined today. Um, the idea that um, certain choke points in that um, global network of sea trafficking, of commerce, if those choke points all were like uh, cut off by some nefarious evil entity all at once, the, the world's economy would crash in 48 hours. It's, it's You can't overstate the importance of uh, uh policing the seas just for the freedom of movement on the seas that that's pro i think that mission is more vital than it was when we started so that means that um this institute that they started is in a sense even more valuable now if that's possible than it was when the fleet was facing its existential crisis in 1873 and i invite you to sort of ponder what would they think if they could see how it's still an important part of uh keeping those sea lanes open today and keeping a healthy Navy today. How do you think Worden would feel knowing that? Yeah, it, I, I thought about that when I was putting this article together. I, I trying to imagine what it would be like for these guys that are, you know, having this, this meeting of, you know, 15 people in, in uh, after hours in, a, in an academic building and have had probably no uh, I, I can't imagine any of them had any great vision enough to see that this thing would grow into what it has become and the fact that it's lasted for a century and a half. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Um, you know, people don't realize that, you know, for, for example, we predate the uh, National Geographic Society. And everybody knows about the National Geographic Society and it's been around forever and ever and so forth, but we predated it. And when they became, um, decided to form their organization, they actually came to the Naval Institute for some advice about how to do this and, and also how to publish a magazine. And if you look at early editions of National Geographic and the Naval Institute proceedings, they're very similar looking in, in design and so forth because they, they, they leaned on us for to get that thing off the ground. So, you know, that, that's one of the many other things that, uh, that kind of reflect the importance of what, what we are, what we've been. Yeah, I love that, that um, we kind of were here before the National Geographic Society, and uh, it, it's so true. If you look at those early National Geographic and early proceedings, I just have to give a shout out to our production folks and periodicals now. They uh, they do a, a slightly better job than people put into covers in those days. It's essentially just the contents on the cover, which is very pragmatic. It makes sense, you know, but... Um, Man, we've come a long way as far as that goes. But you, it's so true. The early proceedings in early National Geographic look like uh, twins of each other. Uh, that, of course, eventually changed. Well, we could talk about uh, Naval Institute lore till the cows come home, Tom. There's so much to it. But with our time limitations, we're focused on um, celebrating the founding and those founders who had a vision, perhaps even greater than they realized. So thanks for the wonderful article in the magazine. Everybody should read this. Um, 
It's a great way to celebrate the Institute's birthday and also learn a little more about what went into that. Tom, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. Uh, we'll be seeing you around. Beach Hall. That's it for us today, folks. Um, thanks for joining us. And on October 9th, give a rousing happy birthday to this U.S. Naval Institute. I know we will be. That's it for now. I'm So, so go ahead and give us that outro one more time, Eric. Oh, really? Damn it. I can only be spontaneous. I can't. It's literally just the last part where you say your name and then I can cut and put. OK, the outro. OK, I can do that. I'm Eric Mills, editor in chief of Naval History Magazine. Until next time, farewell.